What up, cucks? It's your boy, The Hater. And we're going back to that old intro where I say, what up, cucks? It's your boy, The Hater. Just said it twice. Now, against my better judgment, I decided to watch Elimination Chamber last night, and I regret it deeply. Now, there were some good, there were some bad. So let's get to it with a nice little Elimination Chamber review. And with that being said, we started off with the first of our two Elimination Chamber matches. Arguably the least relevant. It depends on how you look at it, right? The winner of this match would go on to uh, get a title shot at the Raw Women's Championship at WrestleMania, you know? All right, fine. At least this gives you... It's almost like a Royal Rumble, right? It's like a second chance. This gives you the opportunity to go and fight for, quote-unquote, the world title. We had Asuka, Carmella, Natalia, Liv Morgan, Nikki Cross, and Raquel Rodriguez. Personally, I narrowed this down to Raquel Rodriguez or Asuka as the possible winners with a slight chance of Liv Morgan winning. But, obviously, uh, the favorite would have had to been Asuka. Now, first up, Natalia comes up against Liv Morgan. Uh, Natalia bores everyone to death. You know, she's lame. But whatever. Liv Morgan actually, in my opinion, did really well. You know what I mean? She kept doing code breakers that Michael Cole kept calling Code Red for some reason. Maybe that's what she calls it, but I highly doubt it because Corey Graves, who knows more, called it the code breaker. Long story short, Liv Morgan had some noteworthy moments. Primarily, there was a point where Natalia put her in the sharpshooter and she wouldn't tap out. Asuka comes in, does like an arm bar as well, right? And then she still wouldn't tap out until she passed out, right? I thought this made her look really strong and it really put over the fact that she's willing to do whatever it takes to win, right? We need more of this. We need more of this kind of storytelling, which I will contrast with storytelling in the main event a little bit later when we talk about that match. You know what I'm saying? Long story short, in the end, it's Carmella and Asuka. They do like a bunch of super kicks on Raquel Rodriguez and pin her, like they double pin her. And then of course, Asuka beats Carmella shortly thereafter. You know what I mean? At, at that point, Obviously, it wasn't going to be Carmella. It was 100% going to be Asuka. So there you have it. That happened. The match, while it had some moments, it really, to me, felt kind of flat, right? It's like, uh, yeah, it's just six jobbers, basically. Asuka's a jobber as far as I'm concerned at this point. But she is the most noteworthy winner. And I think she's going to be Bianca Belair, who, in my personal opinion, has had a horrible title run because she's kind of, you know, formulaic and boring. I don't really like Bianca Belair that much anymore, mother. <laughs> Next up, we had Bobby Lashley versus Brock Lesnar in what I consider to be a great five-star classic. Now, I know what you're all thinking. You're thinking, hater, the match ended with a DQ. How can it be a five-star classic? Well, cucks, that's because I'm rating the entire segment, right? For those of you that didn't watch it, the match was quite short. It was like less than five minutes, like I just said, right? Bobby Lashley and Brock Lesnar keep doing their moves. Long story short, after several spears and several F5s, Lashley slaps on the hurt lock, Right? Brock Lesnar is teasing that he's going to be able to break out of it, but he can't. So what he does instead is he low blows Bobby Lashley, right? And then proceeds to F5 him, right? After he gets disqualified, that is, uh, he also F5s the referee. You know what I mean? Then he F5s Lashley again. Then he throws Lashley to the outside and F5s him through the table. And then the best part was when he grabbed the referee from the outside and then fived him one more time, right? It really put over the fact that Brock Lesnar is basically an ass, but it doesn't matter because the crowd loves Brock Lesnar. Bobby Lashley is boring in comparison. Bobby Lashley is slightly smaller. I always thought he was bigger, but seeing them next to each other is just clear that Brock Lesnar is the superior specimen. Not to sell Lashley short, Lashley is like probably the second uh, best guy in this company in terms of physique and in terms of believability. But he was going up against the first guy. Obviously, this is going to have some sort of resolution at WrestleMania. In my personal opinion, this should be one of the main events, you know. But that's neither here nor there. We'll see what happens, right? Next up, we had what I personally thought was one of the best matches of the night. You know what I'm saying? Edge and Beth Phoenix versus the Judgment Day of Finn Balor and Rhea Ripley. The fact that Edge basically looks as good as he always has is a testament to how good of a wrestler and how good of a legend Edge is. You know what I mean? Um, in my personal opinion, he should be way beyond feuding with these mid-card nobodies called Judgment Day. But what are you going to do, right? This is the plan that they have for him. We'll see what happens at WrestleMania. I expect some sort of tag match involving him and Rey Mysterio versus like a Dominic and like a Finn Balor or something like that because you have to put both him and Rey in the card and this is probably the best way to do it but what are you going to do we'll see how that how that plays out um, the match was great because of the fact that Edge and Beth Phoenix were both wrestling really well Edge better than Beth 
but Beth definitely held her own. Uh, Rhea Ripley, considering what she is, she does a great job. You know, in my opinion, she's the number one broad in this company. And Edge might be the number one dude in this company. I'm not even exaggerating, you know. It's probably Roman Reigns, but Edge has a good um, argument at being the number one guy in this company. Especially considering that he only wrestles once in a while. But every time he does, he, he puts on a good match, right? So, I personally would have loved to just have seen Edge lead the Judgment Day continuously. And then have Edge versus Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. You know what I mean? Judgment Day versus fucking, uh, what's it called? The Bloodline. You could have done it, motherfucks. You could have done it well. You could have even played on the ongoing, endless rivalry between Edge and Rey Mysterio, right? He steals Mysterio's son. He becomes the father figure to Dominic, right? And then at Survivor Series, either in War Games or in a traditional Survivor Series match, you have the Bloodline versus Judgment Day being led by Edge. And Edge either pins Roman or something happens, right? Uh, this is after, of course. And then after that, Edge wins the Rumble or somehow gets a title shot at Roman Reigns. Um, I, he'd have to win the Rumble, I guess, right? That would be the way to book it, you know? Cody Rhodes, in my opinion, is already falling short, but we'll get to that in a bit. Now, after this, we had the Elimination Chamber match for the United States Championship. This match was about 30 minutes long, which, in my opinion, uh, makes it uh, a waste of everyone's time. Now, let, 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 let me get, let me get to, the, to the real crux of the issue here. I mentioned this in a previous video, but the reality is what the reality is, cuckolds, all right? This is a match for the United States Championship and went 30 minutes. I don't think there's ever been a match for the United States uh, title that has gone 30 minutes. You know what I mean? Um, except for like, I think that's it actually. It's probably like, probably the longest U.S. title match of all time, if you ask me. Now, with that being said, the U.S. title is a title that could very easily be defended on the pre-show, right? It has absolutely no bearing on the storyline in WWE. It is a meaningless title. This is a mid-card title that is, in my opinion, inferior to the Intercontinental title. But even if it were superior... The, the fact still remains. The Intercontinental title, which is being held by Gunter for like a thousand years, right? The IC title was a title that Randy Orton didn't even want. When Jeff Hardy was the IC champion and was challenging Orton for the WWF title or whatever the fuck it was for the World Heavyweight title, Randy Orton just low blows Jeff Hardy, hits him with the RKO, essentially disqualifying himself in a match for the Intercontinental title. And then you hear Michael Cole being like, Orton never cared about the IC title. And the answer is, of course he didn't. He's Randy Orton. He's the world champion. Why the fuck would he care about the IC title? Now, the, the, the counter argument to this is that this match was full of complete jobbers, right? I mean, we had Seth Rollins, who I will concede is an upper mid-carder, not a jobber. He's definitely not a main eventer anymore, you know? Main eventers do not, do not appear in Olympic Chamber Chamber matches for the mid-card title. You know, he's a mid-carder, but he's an upper mid-carder, right? You had Austin Theory, who one day is going to get a push of some sort, right? And then you had Bronson Reed, who was fired, like, last year because he wasn't good enough. Damian Priest, who is underrated and did really well. Johnny Gargano, who I don't even know how this guy has a job in the company, to be honest. And Montez Ford, who everyone's talking about, oh, Montez Ford stole the show. Did he? Did he really? Was he really that impressive? Because in my opinion, he bored me half to death. I fell asleep during this match. I'm not even joking, cucks. I mean, I did eat some tres leches up in this piece. So that may have had something to do with it. But I fell asleep nevertheless. So uh, the only noteworthy thing, there's two noteworthy things in this match. Number one, uh, Bronson Reed, or number, I guess three noteworthy things. Bronson Reed was treated almost like a big show, right? In the sense that it took like three finishers to take him out, right? Like, it was clear he was going to get pinned, but he got finishered uh, up the wazoo, as they say, cuckold. Johnny Gargano did the very unimpressive and, you know, anticlimactic one final beat DDT, which shouldn't even be a signature move, but it's like his finisher now all of a sudden, right? Then Rollins hit the stomp, which is a legitimate finishing move that has ended main events, you know what I mean, uh, at WrestleMania. And then this was followed up by Montez Ford, in my opinion, you know, underwhelming splash he should have climbed to the very top of the of the pod right and just done it from there i understand he did other spots but that's an opportunity you know what i mean um that happened and that wasn't very entertaining uh they eliminated him but at least they put him over as like almost like a big show right but you know bronson reed is not a big show he's just a fat jobber you know then after that the second thing of note of course was montez ford i think this was happened before he climbs to he climbs the side of the of the chamber he climbs to the very top and he's like monkey barring it right then he does essentially like a back roll almost while he's holding on and he just lets go and he falls onto the people this was reminiscent of a similar spot that was done by like kazarian or suicide or one of these other jabrones in uh tna when they had that like what's it called the asylum match or whatever with a hole in the, in the top which was actually i thought a cool idea personally but whatever point is 
that was a good spot. And then, of course, the best part was the end. Um, as, as it should be evident, Austin Theory, the only other person in this match that has any business being a mid-card champion, because the other ones are jobbers in, in their absolute worst day and absolute best day as well. Austin Theory beat Seth Rollins after, of course, good old Logan Paul up in this piece came out and, of course, cost Seth Rollins the match. Uh, intercepting him while he was going to do like a diving maneuver and then hitting the stomp on him, right? And then after that, it was a wrap, right? Um, like I said, obviously, it was going to be Logan Paul versus Seth Rollins. Um, I don't know why Logan Paul is attacking Seth Rollins, though. That's just weird. It should be the other way around. You know what I mean? Seth Rollins should be attacking Logan Paul because Seth Rollins is the one that was eliminated from the Rumble by Logan Paul. So it makes more sense for Seth Rollins to be the one who's angry than vice versa. But... Leave that up to like shitty booking. In my opinion, Logan Paul, once again, impressed. I really do believe, and I know people are probably not going to like this, but I really do believe that certainly athletically, Logan Paul is better than basically almost everyone uh, on this card, with the exception of maybe Lashley and Lesnar. Aside from that, he's a better athlete than Rollins. He's a better athlete than Reigns. He sure as shit is a better athlete than Sami Zayn. He is like a pure athlete, right? So his, his athleticism in and of itself is enough, in my opinion, to warrant his spot on the card. Forget about his celebrity. But I honestly do believe that if you train Logan Paul seriously in wrestling for like a year and a half, he would be better at wrestling than everyone on this card except for Edge, Lesnar, and possibly Bobby Lashley. He would become a better wrestler than Reigns. He would become a better wrestler than Seth Rollins, who's right now one of the best wrestlers around. He would be better. And also, what the fuck has happened to Seth Rollins? This guy's just looking sloppier and sloppier every fucking time, you know? Remember when he was jacked and muscular? You know, and all of a sudden now he's just like, he looks like a mid-carder, you know? I guess that's what happens when you when you get put in a mid-card up in this piece. But anyways, uh, that went down the way it went down, and there you go. That's how... That's how the, the storyline goes here. You know, we're going to see what happens. Lastly, and finally, we had the main event. Now, the main event took a fucking eternity. I knew it would, but just the entrances alone took a, a thousand years, it felt like, right? Now, the main event is the type of main event that people are going to love. People are going to talk about this match as if it was the best match they've ever seen, right? Personally, I didn't particularly like it. It reminded me a lot of, uh, what's it called? The storyline between Jey Uso and Roman Reigns like a year and a half ago, right? It's the same fucking storyline. You know, people are pretending like this is like the best written storyline of all time. It's the same storyline. It's basically the disgruntled guy who doesn't want to be the underling anymore. That's what it is at its core, right? The fact that Sami Zayn stood up to Roman Reigns is no different than the fact that Jey Uso stood up to Roman Reigns. It's the same fucking thing. And as a matter of fact, they almost alluded to it during the match. After the 17th time the referee took a bump, right? Jey Uso comes in and pretty much just wastes everyone, everyone's time. He comes in there. Roman gives him a chair to go attack Sami Zayn. It's the same thing that happened at the last pay-per-view where he gave Sami Zayn a chair to attack Kevin Owens. But instead of hitting either Sami Zayn or Roman Reigns, Jey Uso just stood there and took it. And he got pushed in the face several times. And that, that led to that. Now, here's the problem. After all this, this shit happened... We were reminded very quickly that Sami Zayn is a jobber and that Roman Reigns is the champion. And that's when Sami Zayn tried to spear Roman Reigns. He takes out Jey Uso instead. Roman Reigns picks up the chair that Jey Uso had, beats the shit out of Sami Zayn with it. Sami Zayn gets up, gets speared. One, two, three. It's a wrap, right? They pan to the crowd where a bunch of people are left with their mouths agape, surprised that the jobber, the mid-card jobber, lost to the probably the, one of the best main eventers of all time in terms of booking. Right? Of course he was going to lose, you dipshits. Did you really think Sami Zayn was going to main event WrestleMania? Have you lost your mind? This is like, Sami Zayn is the kind of guy that if you're going to give him a world title, he's like a Kofi Kingston at best, right? You give him the world title when you have another champion that's better and more important, right? K Kofi Kingston can go ahead and beat Daniel Bryan, who has the vegan belt, right? Which is made out of like hemp, right? While the other champion on Raw leads the, the the charge, if you will, right? That's the that's the purpose of a, of a Kofi Kingston or a Sami Zayn. The same thing. Sami Zayn is never going to be the undisputed world champion. He's never going to be the face of the company, right? Because he cannot be the face of the company because he doesn't even get his hair cut, all right? So with that being said, Sami Zayn, you know, he did good. Like, like I can't fault Sami Zayn. 
He's doing what he can with his limited ass moveset as well as his limited ass like storyline. Because people, I understand people are, are just confused and they don't see good storylines. So, you know, giving them the same thing as a year and a half ago where uh, people did the exact same thing, right? To them, seems like new wrestling. But it's not new wrestling, cucks. It's the same fucking storyline. And it seems like they're going to do it again with Jey Uso. Now... Uh, at a certain point, I understand we were in Montreal, so of course, uh, what's his face? Uh, Kevin Owens would have to invariably come out, right? He would have to come out because that's just how it, how it goes, right? The crowd needs to be pandered to, you know what I mean? And that's the problem, right? The problem is we have to pander to the crowd. This was an opportunity to actually bring out Cody Rhodes... To remind the fans that there's a cocksucker called Cody Rhodes that's going to be at WrestleMania. Because how the fuck would I even remember what's happening when in the main event, the people being profiled are Sami Zayn uh, Zayn and Kevin Owens, right? Kevin Owens beat the shit out of Roman Reigns and Jimmy Uso. Jey Uso was taken out by the spear or by the, whatever, by the chair shot. What the fuck? I don't don't remember. It was a chair shot or a spear. Who cares? Who Who knows? Who cares? The point is, uh, he was taken out and, you know, I guess it would make no sense for him to come back, but... Jimmy Uso got destroyed. Roman Reigns got destroyed by Kevin Owens, right? And then Sami Zayn hit hit the uh, Haluva kick, Haluva kick, I should say, right for the second time in the in the in the segment, and that's it. He stood over Roman Reigns, but so what? It doesn't matter. The feud is over. Why is Roman Reigns coming out looking weak after this feud, right? He should come out looking strong, and therefore make for a good adversary for Cucky Rhodes to overcome at WrestleMania. Now, personally, what I think should happen and what I want to happen is Roman Reigns beats Cody Rhodes. And the reason why I want that to happen is because Cody Rhodes, in my opinion, is another Sami Zayn. He can, if you want, if you absolutely must give him a run with the title, you know, make Brock Lesnar the universal champion and let Cucky Rhodes become the world champion for like a few months, right? The WWE champion, I should say, right? Give one of the titles to a real wrestler like Brock Lesnar or Roman Reigns, or even Drew McIntyre, and then you can have Cucky Rhodes win part of it through a, di- through, a, through a different way, right? That's the way you do this. It's There's no other reasonable way to get this done, right? But, you know, obviously it's WrestleMania, and I would say that at every WrestleMania, the Royal Rumble winner is, generally speaking, the favorite to win the title match, especially when the Royal Rumble winner is fighting the main champion. Like Nakamura didn't win, but he fought the, let's be honest, I love AJ Styles, one of my favorites of all time, but he fought the B champion in AJ Styles, right? So who cares? It doesn't matter, right? Same thing. Rhea Ripley is going to be favored to beat Charlotte. Anything could happen, right? But that's that's how it's that's how it's being presented to us, cuckolds. So with that being said, I personally believe that Cody Rhodes has no business being um, in, in my opinion, in wrestling at all, like I don't know what this fucking asshole adds to the to the card. He's decent in the ring, but like this John Cena, you know, next John Cena gimmick is not working out. You know what I mean? We have, and I'll and I'll say it, you know, I'll say it like it is as usual, as usual, motherfucks. Like we have Austin Theory. Austin Theory is great. He looks like a million bucks in terms of his physique. Like he looks like like he would destroy Cody Rhodes, right? There was a point where all of us, it was so goofy. It's like, I understand that Austin Theory is like the cowardly heel in many ways, but there was a point where he's hiding, right? In the, in the pod, in one of the pods from Johnny Gargano, I believe it was, and Seth Rollins. And it's like Seth Rollins is like behind him, like waiting all coy, like waiting for him to turn around so he can beat the shit out of him, right? And I'm like, you just look at Seth Rollins and then you look at Austin Theory and you're like, okay, clearly Austin Theory would completely massacre Seth Rollins in real life just based on their physiques. And he would massacre 15 Johnny Garganos, right? So it's like, obviously two on one, one man seldom can beat two men. But it was just ridiculous that Austin Theory was afraid of Johnny Gargano, who I would destroy in about five seconds. You know what I'm saying? So it, it doesn't even matter like how, how they present him. But the idea is that you have Austin Theory who's younger then Cody has a better physique, and in my opinion, is better in the ring. But that's neither here nor there. He's going to get his chance too. But that's the one that they, they need to be pushing, right? Hell, I'll even take Logan Paul at this point before Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes is in his mid-30s. He's only like a few years younger than Roman Reigns. And that's the thing that bothers me the most, is that like the way that it's being presented, I just Googled it. Roman Reigns is 37, soon to be 38, but he's going to be 37 at WrestleMania. And let's see how old Cucky Rhodes is. 37 here, Cucky Rhodes, 37. They're actually the same age 
It, it, Cody Rhodes is like a month younger than Roman Reigns. But the way that the storyline has been presented and the way that people talk about it online is like Roman Reigns needs to move over to make some room for the young guys. What young guys? Roman Reigns is like a multiple-time WrestleMania main eventer and he's going to headline WrestleMania once again. But now it's going to be against Cody Rhodes, who is his age, right? And who is best known for having one good match with Rey Mysterio at WrestleMania and then having a few matches with Darby Allen that 50 people watched, right? The fact that Cody Rhodes is in the main event screams of nepotism, and I don't like it. You know what I mean? It is what it is. They are, they're high on cocky Rhodes, but in my opinion, it's almost a joke. The only way that I would book Cody Rhodes at WrestleMania would be this. Somehow, somehow Triple H comes out uh, on Monday and just screws him and says... That's it, Cucky. You're not going to be the main event. But but I won the Royal Rumble. Tough shit. Nobody likes you. You suck ass. We're changing the rules. It's going to be Sami Zayn or whoever the fuck they choose, right? And then you, you start a program. Cody Rhodes versus Triple H. The match happens at WrestleMania. Cody Rhodes tries to do a disaster kick. Triple H just slaps him in the face midair. Picks him up. Pedigrees him about five or seven times. Pins him one, two, three. Tosses him out of the ring. And we never hear about Cody Rhodes ever again. That's the way that I would book Cody Rhodes myself. But that's not the hero there, mother. Instead, we're going to see Cody Rhodes in what, what I can only describe as the worst main event in the history of WrestleMania, except for, of course, when Becky Lynch main evented and won against Charlotte and Ronda Rousey. That was the worst one. But this is going to be a very close second. You know what I mean? And the facts are what the facts are. Either it's going to, Cody Rhodes is going to win by coming back, fighting resiliently, and hitting three crossroads in a row. Or he's not going to do that, and he's going to get speared and one, two, three. That, those are the only two outcomes, right? There's no opportunity here for twists or turns, right? And if they do a twist or turn, they don't need to because it's not going to be good anyways, motherfuckers. And with that being said, take care of yourself and go fuck your own mothers up in this bitch. You know what I'm saying?